He learned as a pokey little town. North of Bathurst strict with history. It has attracted many prominent artists throughout the ages. It was a mining town that peaked in the 1850s to the 1870s during the gold rush. In its heyday, it had an enormous population of 8,000. With two newspapers, five banks, eight churches and... 28 pubs! Go hell end. That beats Bathurst with a population of over 40,000 and having only 14 pubs. Geez, Bathurst, you better step up. By 1945, the gold rush in Hillend had practically died. However, the artist boom had by now only just started. In the 1940s, prominent artists such as Russell Drysdale, who, by the way, art teachers are always, always going on about, and Donald Friend, sorry Donald, I haven't heard of you before, visited Hillend. This was the beginning of an endless stream of artists wanting to paint, sketch and photograph the isolated Hillend landscape in all its glory. In doing this, the evolution of the Hillend landscape was documented in each and every artwork. Starting with Donald Friend's <laughs> artwork, Hillend Landscape in 1951, depicting a mining landscape from the peak of the gold rush with a big fat hole in the foreground, houses, houses, more houses, and what looks like, with no surprises, a pub in the midground and the rolling hills in the background. <laughs> well, of course, it wouldn't be Hill End without hills, would it? Second on our timeline, Frederick Smith's artwork, or more correctly, photograph, Miner's Cottage in 1987, depicting yet another house, albeit a spooky, derelict, dead miner's house. This is contrast to the prosperous atmosphere of our old mate Donald's work shown previously. It shows the evolution of a prosperous mining town into a ghost town. Third on our Hill End timeline, Annika Silver's Donald's sign. Donald seems to be popping up everywhere. Drysdale, where are you? What happened? Which depicts, yet again, another pub. <coughs> now stepping away from pubs, an artwork by Nicole Welch, Illumination No. 2, 2012. Hill End is depicted in an elegant fashion, but still with ties to the town's history with the chandelier representing the intrusion of Europeans into the untouched landscape of Australia. Since Nicole was 14, she aspired to be an artist and never imagined her art would be in the Bathurst collection. Now, her art has become a part of Hillands history and Bathurst as well, adding to the timeline of creativity. You can add to this story as well by creating and making your own art. One day you too could make history with art. Thank you Generation Art for giving us this wonderful opportunity in displaying this video in front of all you people. And getting embarrassed. I <laughs> like, why did I have that at the end? G'day. How's it going? I'm Chris. I'm Karen. And I'm Nick. And we're here today to present to you our experiences we've had in the Bathurst Regional Gallery. Experiences like seeing art we've never looked at before, artists we've never seen before, and a place where these things come together to make an amazing mixture of culture. We also plan to tell you a bit about some of the artists we have so newly discovered. The exhibition at Bathurst Regional Gallery was mainly devoted to one artist, Rosemary Valadon, whose art meditates upon women's place and identity. Her subversive images of femme fatales holding guns towards conventional depictions of women as passive subjects, their weapons are not a real threat, but rather their conventional gazes that defy the onlooker by looking straight back. What are my thoughts on this topic concerning feminine power? Well, her interest in feminine power and depictions of women throughout the ages has been a major focus in her work. But this has been explored through the theoretical worlds of ancient mythologies, philosophical theories, and fairy tales, which is exciting and gives a new perspective on the sexes. Valadon is keenly aware of how women's bodies are traditionally operated as muses of forms of inspiration, but never as autonomous beings. The exhibition was not just a celebration of her work, but also of her sharp insight into the difficulty of working in a field overwhelmingly dominated by men. Around about four weeks in, the exhibit was swapped with Jam Factory, which Nick will discuss in The Tick, and an artist called Robert Vrain. Unfortunately, we didn't see much of his work to start off, as we were in a bit of an excursion phase, but luckily we had plenty of time as the exhibition went on for a while, so we had enough time to have a cat and cook. But anyways, Robert Vrain is an artist that does tapestries. There were many of his artworks, but it wasn't all of them, because he has dozens of tapestries. 
His work starts off with a brief idea in his mind on what he'll do, and then he seems to just go with the flow. His artworks vary in explicity, some being G-rated while others are not so much. So what do I think of Robert Stahl and his tapestries? Well, from what I saw, he doesn't stick to one main theme, which is good. Honestly, I like his work, and he's unique. Very unique. During the time that Robert Brain had his exhibition, another group who go by the name Gem Factory had an exhibition featuring heavily on glass sculptures. I'll be talking mainly about one of the more influential figures within Gem Factory, Claire Belfridge. Claire takes her inspiration from the natural world that she constantly invests her time in. Her artworks consist of glass-blown vases that are covered with intricate lines and curves. She has been in the glass art business for about 25 years and has displayed her artworks all over the place, including Adelaide, Canberra and good old Bathurst. In addition to Australia, Claire regularly features her artworks in North America, Europe, Hong Kong and New Zealand. She has won many awards including the Tom Malone Glass Prize by the Art Gallery of Western Australia. What has me confused the most about her artworks is what they actually mean. In my opinion, her artworks are talking about fishing nets and fishing. Her artworks are heavily entwined with the idea of water and rivers. Our experiences through this program, we've been privileged to learn more about art than we could have ever wanted. We got to meet inspiring artists from the region, other students like ourselves who are keen to share experiences and make new friends. In fact, Chris and myself met Kerrid during this program for a completely different school. Thank you, Generation Art. Thank you, Generation Art. Thank you, Generation Art. the 1950s Sydney-based abstraction sourced in post-war European traditions. To create art, there is no set process. Art can be anything. Sculpture, painting, drawing, printmaking, movie making, audio, installation, the list just doesn't end. Once this art is created, it is made to be enjoyed. No matter what age, size, race, religion or gender the viewer is, it is made to be observed and taken in, to spark conversation and create and encourage creativity. As we stated before, art is in so many different forms, it's crazy. And just because it's your lucky day, 
we are going to show you five different examples of creativity in action. Nine O'Clock was painted by Roger Hine in 1968 and it is the first example of a form of art we will show you. This form of art is a painting, meaning it is 2D, and it was painted using acrylic paint. The second form of art we will show you is called Rocks, Ghost and Half Moon, and it was painted by Vicky Powers in 1981 using a screen print. This is different again to painting, as it's using a screen print, not a paintbrush and paint. Winter Shipley Trees is the third example of an art form we will show you, and it's very different from the first two, as this art form is 3D. It is known as a ceramic, and was painted by Peter Rushforth in 1981. Long Reef was painted in 1962 by Victor Cusack. It's the fourth example of a form of art we will show you, and alike to the first two, it's a painting, meaning it's 2D. The fifth and last form of art we will show you is called Open Doorway. It was painted by Grace Cosington-Smith in 1960 and again is a 2D art form.